Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Awesome Wholesaler Experience Podcast, where we look into the many facets of the job, the career, and the lifestyle of investment and insurance product wholesaling. I'm your host, the creator of the Awesome Wholesaler Experience, and yours truly, Awesome Mike. Hey, everyone. Today on the show, we have a great guest, very interesting fellow, world traveler, but has his roots here in the Midwest, so my kind of guy. But uh, let me get, just get right into his bio a little bit. Uh, today's guest is Mr. Mark Lancaster, and he is a securities processing industry entrepreneur. Now, he currently serves as president of Great Lakes Fund Solutions, which provides extensive back office support to public and private direct investment funds. We're going to get into uh, Great Lakes Solutions quite a bit today. But prior to taking over the reins at Great Lakes Fund Solutions, Mark was a vice president of business development at Advanced Fund Administration, AFA, which was originally established and located in the Cayman Islands. This is going to be important later. Now, Mark was also vice president of Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation in their Wealth Management Services Division. He's been the director of new business development for Fortis Prime Fund Solutions, which focuses on hedge fund administration. He served as a client executive for the Bank of New York, where he was a banker responsible for European broker dealer and hedge fund activities. He actually spent four years in Switzerland as the executive director for the Union Bank of Switzerland. Sounds like an oxymoron to me, Union Bank of Switzerland, where he was a banker in the financial institutions group focusing on broker dealers in New York and Europe. Now, Mark got his start in banking as a vice president at the Bank of New York, um, and he was a commercial banker there. Within the securities industry banking division, he was responsible for firms in the Midwest territory. Now, Midwest is his home. He also was educated there, at least formerly. He graduated from Indiana University's Kelly School of Business with an MBA in finance. He also earned his BA in economics from DePaul University. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give me a warm welcome for our guest today, Mr. Mark Lancaster. Thanks for coming on the show. Mark, how are you today, sir? Very well, awesome, Mike. Good <laughs> to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on. I have to ask you a question, though. Okay, so Cayman Islands, Midwest, New York, Bank of New York, Switzerland, just you're, you're a world traveler. You're a renaissance man, but I got to ask you, where in the world did you learn how to play foosball? <laughs> in my basement in the Midwest. That's uh, as my buddy Dan Breen would say, you got, you know, you got Midwestern winter skills, you ping pong and foosball. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we were at Adisa one time and someone had the uh, imagination to pull a foosball table out of the closet somewhere. And let's just say it was not only a clinic, it was a seminar given by Mark Lancaster on how to play the fine table soccer game. I enjoyed that very much. And I've enjoyed our friendship and business relationships over the years too, Mark. Appreciate, appreciate uh, who you are, man. So let, let's kind of peel back the layers of the onion a little bit, not to call you an onion. Sorry, I didn't come up early. But, uh, you know, you got your start in the Midwest. You went to school in the Midwest and very quickly, um, you know, broadened your horizon. So how did that come about? Was it something at the Kelly School that, that kind of launched you into that role? Well, uh, you know, I had a father who was a commercial banker. I decided uh, I was going to go into commercial banking. I came from the Chicago area, which is the second city, not the third, but still called the second city, and uh, decided, hey, you know, I might as well go to the first city, uh, uh, you know, uh, and g get into a big bank's uh, commercial banking program. And it was clear that there was going to be consolidation happening in the banking industry and that New York was going to play a pretty prominent role uh, in that. So, uh, so we, uh, we moved to New York. Wow. And over the years. So, so what, when was that? When did you move to New York? What year? 1987. And within a month, the uh, stock market had crashed and uh, my bank had a hostile takeover against it. The first in the industry, uh, 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 commercial banking industry of a hostile takeover. You know, we call that uh, Murphy's law around here. Um, I've been married to a Murphy for 
20 plus years. So I'm used to it, you know, what can go wrong, going wrong. So that the, so, so really, um, it was a black Friday is your fault then. <laughs> yes, you can say so. <laughs> is that right? Is that right? So, you, so you're there in New York and, um, you, you know, you probably embraced the culture there quite a bit. Um, you had some, you know, I'd call it some successes, right. And, and, can you tell us, was it your training that led to some successes or did you kind of, did you, you know, did you really learn on the fly from some of your mentors that were there? Um, you know, who, who was really influential on in, in developing your entrepreneurial character? Well, I, I, you know, ever since graduate school, uh, I, uh, I'm, I had a minor in entrepreneurship and I had a professor there who was an entrepreneur himself, an unusual guy you know, for academia, right? He, he owned businesses and uh, he, he realized sort of staying at one place probably wasn't a good idea. He, he actually started the entrepreneurship school at Indiana University and then at Wharton, at University of Iowa and two other schools. His name was Ed Moult, uh, passed away in 2016. And he taught me one key lesson, which was it's much easier to buy a business that's already up and running than it is to start a business. And uh, it was, uh, when I went into commercial banking he, and told him that I got a job offer was gonna move to New York, he said, oh my God, that's the worst thing you can do. You'll never <laughs> get into entrepreneurship. You'll be so risk averse, you'll be scared to do it. And uh, yeah, it did take me 24 years, but uh, I got there in the end. And uh, Sorry, uh, he wasn't around uh, uh, mentally at that point because he had Alzheimer's to uh, uh, share my success and give me some tips now, which would be handy. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I bet you could probably uh, dig up some of his writings. And a lot of times, you know, especially the old school guys, they did a lot more journaling. Um, you know, I've been encouraged to journal quite a bit before I get too old. And, and maybe you can capture some of those words of wisdom from that, but I appreciate you giving him a shout out. Are you, uh, does he have any kind of, um, you know, being that he started all those different, um, call them seeds of, of, of wealth and, and structured, are they still around? Can you, does he have a fund that we can contribute to? Does he have any kind of, um, you know, anything like that at all? I, I don't know the answer to that. Not sure. Might be worth digging into. So, so you take off, you go to the big city, and uh, tell us about, you know, how, what is it like being, being a commercial banker? Well, it is, um, you know, you're helping the organization get out of its way, own way, basically, because um, there are uh, lots of products within, within the organization. Um, there are lots of people who, you know, are just learning about the organization as they represent it. Um, so, you know, you really have to be your client's advocate at a commercial bank to help them navigate the organization effectively. And from what I know about commercial banks, that, you know, that skill set and the need for that relationship manager role has not really changed much uh, since I was in commercial banking. You know, you mentioned an interesting phrase and that's to help them to get out of their own way. And the reason why I say that that's interesting is because that's kind of what you do now. And before we jump into, you know, Great Lakes fund solutions, I mean, that's, that's really what you're doing is you're helping these firms to get out of their way, uh, at least in my my vision, and that might sound a little bit disparaging, but you get the the idea. I want to hear about your time overseas, though, and you know, can you? How did that happen? And you know, what were some of the key takeaways from that? Well, the um, yeah, you know, I was working in New York for uh, Union Bank of Switzerland at the time, and I uh, uh, a colleague uh, of mine had just finished a uh, couple of year stint in London, uh, expanding the broker dealer relationships that we had uh, within the London and European market. And his time was coming to a close. It uh, worked on several levels for me to uh, uh, pull up stakes and, and do that. Uh, you know, the kids were young and portable and, um, 
And uh, yeah, we jumped in and it was a great experience. I ended up staying there for a lot longer than I expected because sort of similar to the 1987 story, I just told within a year of getting over in London, ready to have my, you know, uh, adventure, the, uh, uh, my bank, you know, had, had a takeover, you know, uh, happen. And uh, Union Bank of Switzerland was acquired essentially by Swiss Bank Corporation, who had already exited commercial banking once. And they, you know, although the, the, uh, the organization's name was UBS, after the deal, it was the SBC people who were in charge and they said, you know what, I think we're gonna exit commercial banking again. Um, and, uh, and so I was, you know, out of a job in London <laughs> and having to decide, all right, you know, do I move, move back? Do I stay here as a local hire? Uh, what do I do? I ultimately um, decided to stay back, uh, stay there as a local hire. Um, uh, return to, to Bank of New York. Uh, I, I would tell people I was out on repo. <laughs> <you know? laughs> and uh, 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 began working for them again uh, at a point where they were expanding very significantly in Europe through acquisition and otherwise, and uh, uh, stayed there for, for a number of years, uh, seven, I believe. So when you were in, when you were actually in London then, were you in yeah. the city? Like, were you downtown in the city city or you were out in, in the Heath? Yeah, first we were uh, at Bank of New York. First we were in Mayfair and then at uh, Canary Wharf. Yeah. But, so, which is outside of the city, mm -hmm. capital C. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm modestly familiar um, with the city. I know a banker. In fact, he's a broadcaster now. And uh, he, he talks about the city is actually, a, you know, it's kind of like Manhattan for New York. Um, and then he, he goes out, he runs in Hampstead Heath and he goes to the, the men's pond and, you know, does his cold, cold water diving there craziness. But London's a very interesting place. Um, you know, especially when you can contrast it to living in, in New York city, wouldn't you say? Uh, it is super, uh, super interesting. And the international aspect of doing business there is, uh, I really, learned a lot and, um, uh, you know, had the help of uh, a great network of people based throughout the continent who I needed to partner with basically in order to get my, you know, divisions, product lines seen and known and uh, uh, sold ultimately. So that, that's interesting too. You know, a lot of the, the listeners on the show are wholesalers. And do you, do you, you did it yourself, and it sounds like you're giving credit to your success from it, but you aligned yourself with, you call them partners. How, how would you see, or I mean, do you recommend a wholesaler does that too? Or can they do it in the same regard? You know, some of our wholesalers are out there, and they've, they've got the us against the world mentality, you know, as opposed to more of a collaborative force. Yeah, my dad once said that, uh, you know, there isn't any limit to what you can accomplish as long as you're not worried about who gets the credit and um, you know, you want to develop partnerships with people and get them to spend time on the thing that is important to you because you see a benefit for you and the other person. Um, you have to be the type of person who is going to help make them look good when, when you're successful. What about the guy that says, well, I don't want to, you know, help my competition to be successful. Um, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather take them and get the spoils of their demise. Is that short-sighted? Well, I, I mean, you know, I, 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 these people weren't the competition. They were the, the, the local offices in Paris, Madrid, uh, uh, Frankfurt, uh, uh, Amsterdam to, to uh, help, get the, uh, help get the product sold, who had the language skills, had broad knowledge of the organization, possibly even broader than mine because, you know, everybody rolled through that office and uh and they had to help everybody sort of sell their services uh at a bank like that i see so you're not necessarily collaborating with your call it competitors you're actually going more grassroots with the with the supporters of your of your cause if you would 
It and would be it. helpful if I was a polyglot and spoke, uh, you know, six languages. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some some of the folks in Europe do. I mean, they're they're it's a it's amazing, and, and you know, they all speak English, right? Mm-hmm. So I think you, you had the basis covered, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just because you only speak English doesn't mean at the lunch that you're at. You know, they're going to speak English. Only, so. yeah, only English will be spoken. Yeah, I spent some time in the army in Germany, and um, it was a it was a little bit frustrating, frankly, because um, I would be talking to someone and they would be speaking just fine English, and then someone else would walk up and bam, they would start speaking this hocking a hocking a gibberish, and I'm like, <laughs> and I mean, I felt really uh, inferior, frankly, because I didn't know how to communicate. So you probably felt some of the same. You know, did, did, you have, um, did you have any kind of a cultural disconnect? You know, I know it's still Europe, um, but were there any customs that you had to really embrace or learn to do business, you know, in a, it's called a strange environment? And then when you answer that too, do you think it would be, is it more helpful? Like, did you have to be sharper at the customs and the way of doing business as opposed to if you were just simply doing it in, in the Midwest, where you, you kind of maybe take it for granted and you almost can not be as sharp or as on point because you're, you figure that you have, you know, a great understanding of the culture. Uh, yeah. There, the list of things I learned or had to learn as, as long as my arm and, um, and, you know, how to, to work the organization and uh, uh, get it to perform I thought was was more challenging than it would have been uh, had I you know remained in the states with the with the same organization and um, you know just you know personalities preferences and scarcity. I mean these people in you know in the Madrid office say you know that they've got hundreds of people who know their name and they're trying to get you know X Y and Z sold. And, um, you know, you've just got to respect their time, but, you know, do everything you can to uh, um, recruit their help to, to get the job done. Now, now, that sounds like a wholesaler. I mean, how do you break through? Our wholesalers today, even in the, the small little space of alternative investments where you're an expert, how, how do you see successful wholesalers breaking through that noise? Literally, there are, I don't know how many, dozens of each type of fund, whether it's a BDC or an interval fund or whatever, there's dozens of each of them, and they all have a just a you know pretty penny that's out there out there representing their fund. How does a wholesaler break through? Well, it's got to start with I think listening and understanding what the individual's perspective on the industry is. Uh, you know, understanding the things that they're just never going to buy and, and uh, why that is and uh, the things they have bought and why that may have been and, uh, and then extrapolate from, from that before you start to sell and uh, potentially waste time, waste your breath, uh, waste the other person's time, which people are pretty unforgiving about these days. Um, and then once you're, once you're allocated your time in the right direction with the right people, um, you know, just continue to put the best foot forward and listen to what they're telling you. Do you, do you happen to recall a story, whether it was something in France or Spain or somewhere where, where you had to kind of do that, you had to kind of, you know, pick your poison and then once you got some traction, were able to, to maximize it? Well, the, uh, Yes, I mean I, I can uh, remember a situation in uh, Brussels of you know uh, coming to understand wh why it was that this party was looking in the first place. What why it was that uh, they uh, they needed help and um, uh, and and that. That was it, you know. I mean, in in effect, uh, uh, when it comes to securities processing business, the bank is uh, providing credit at, and their name at the same time that they're providing a, a service, 
and you don't always know whether it, they're really looking for an improvement in service or it's the credit enhancement that they they, they need. And um, uh, this was the second case, and um, uh, and so buttoning up the uh, the risk side of it and uh, making a, a case that the bank wanted to do be business with the party was was key in this case. Yeah, that, that old listening thing, that's, that's a hard component sometimes nowadays. Um, you know, my ears are so small, you know, and my, my mouth is so big. Um, at least that's what I found as a wholesaler. Sometimes you, you're so excited about the potential and about your product and about your company and about this last thing you just learn you want to tell the world. And I found, and maybe you can, uh, can agree or not, uh, at least comment on, that everyone listens to the same radio station. It's W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? <laughs> Wouldn't you agree? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you may, may have, even if that is your perspective, you, you, you may have to take some acting classes to make sure it doesn't come off that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. So, so you're, you're over, you're overseas, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're destroying, um, financial centers of the world, <laughs> New York to then London. And actually, you know, you probably learned the most. Um, sometimes you find you learn the most during the, the most volatile and turbulent times. Um, in my recent experience as a wholesaler, I've sat down with financial advisors that have never experienced a bear market. I mean, just think about that. They've never, they've been in the business almost 10 years and they've never seen anything but green arrows that can really skew your perception on, you know, risk and protection planning and such. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how that plays out. Um, what, what have you seen, Mark, from your end of it? Have you seen these, these, especially the, the creative new products that you're servicing now, have you seen kind of a, um, I guess a nonchalant methodology with our new generation because they haven't seen a bear market? Are these younger firms and younger younger folks just kind of oblivious to the, the potential dangers? Well, it doesn't take uh, a young person to uh, pat themselves on the back a little bit too heavily and to, um, you know, to extrapolate based on the past eight or nine years and think it's going to continue and then suddenly be blindsided when it, when it doesn't, I mean, you know, every recession and business cycle has had people of all ages along for the, the, the ride and getting burned by it. The problem is you, you know, you, 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 you're forced to keep your chips on the table in, in some way. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, the green ones are possibly, uh, a little bit more susceptible to, uh, um, uh, you know, thinking that, Hey, this, this, this really good news unfolded that therefore I'm a genius and uh, uh, not, uh, not realizing that uh, luck uh, plays into an awful lot of circumstances. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Not, not only, I mean, young as far as like in life ages, but even, um, you know, folks that have just gotten involved with the securities business because of its, you know, rosy appearance to you, to it. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. And you're going to see a lot of that because, you know, your firm does a lot of the back office work for a lot of these other um, companies. And let's kind of dig into that a little bit. Now, as I was, as I was researching the fund, uh, excuse me, the company, which is called Great Lakes, Great Lakes Fund Solutions. And um, well, in its origin, it was started by, you know, a couple guys back in 1972. Um, Mark Veneman and Al DeSanto, they sold, Mark, or actually Al sold some of his shares to, to Diane. And, um, but in 82, 1982, they reorganized and they created what's, what was called Marco, Marco, Marcal? Marcal. Mark Markel. and Al Markel. Yeah, yeah. I figured that out. It took me a little <laughs> while. And I was like, because your, your name, Mark, was with the K and this fellow's name was with the C, Mark and Al. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's pretty ingenious, Markel. Uh, corp, corporation or systems corporation, but then you took over and you named you renamed it Great Lakes Fund Solutions in 2011. Can you tell us how you seized the reins of that company and uh, and why you did that? I was working um, during the Great Recession for a uh, fund administration company, 
and uh, that was growing and a uh, relatively young company. And uh, I came across an opportunity uh, to, to purchase Markel Systems Corporation. I, I found him online, could see the age of the uh, owners and stopped by to learn about their business and, uh, um, you know, ask if they'd be interested in having my employer, you know, look into buying them. And it came to pass that the employer was not interested. And one of the key reasons for that was that, that they managed their own IT uh, uh, system that they provided the service on. And, and in the hedge fund administration business, precious few hedge fund administrators took that approach of, of uh, building their own software uh, to provide the service. And uh, so not surprising that they were a bit spooked by that. And uh, a year later when, when uh, I was in between jobs and uh, you know, looking for the next thing and in financial services, uh, you, know, you, you get past 40, 45, you know, there are a lot of people looking you know, for new careers at that point and uh and so i had to uh consider whether it was time to take my uh old professor's advice and 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 look into uh purchasing a business and uh it took quite a few months to uh negotiate uh, a deal and but uh but that's exactly what we did oddly enough uh, it was the IT that also scared me kind of the most about it because I had never managed directly, uh, you know, an IT uh, workforce and uh, development team. Um, but it wasn't very long uh, after the deal that I realized that that was one of the most exciting and liberating part of uh, what the company was because um I had sales experience and relationship management experience. Selling was really important at this point of the game, uh, right after the acquisition. And uh, it, uh, to, to be able to uh, say with confidence, uh, you, you know, you had the, the uh, IT capability to, to deliver any modifications that the client might require, uh, was a you know it's a really empowering thing to to uh, be able to sell like that well let me let me read something from your website and uh, folks can find it i believe uh, i just punched in gray lakes funds and it comes it comes up gray lakes fund solutions.com i'm pretty sure anyways they they are uh transfer agent and fund administrator for alternative investment programs near and dear to my heart of course uh, it says on here, you service both private and publicly registered funds. Client investment strategies include real estate, futures, energy, private equity. And it says you provide unequaled investor services for such programs that are distributed through RIA and independent broker dealer channels. And I'll skip forward a little bit. It says that this support comes from, uh, or is in the form of sales literature fulfillment, call service, excuse me, call center services, processing of sub docs and redemptions, cash management, calculating sales commissions, providing customized reports, hosting a custom investor advisor web portal, regulatory compliance support, investor distribution processing, and year-end tax allocation to the investors. But wait, there's more. And then you go on to say that you view your role as providing any IT and, in, and administrative support that helps the fund sponsor create a successful product. It sounds almost like amazingly great is what you're doing there. Um, are, you, are you really um, the secret sauce to what, what the future broker dealer that's distributing product could, could have? You're gonna, well, I'm seeing that you're taking a lot of, of um, non-expertise activity off of their plate so they can focus on what they do and your firm can focus on what you do the best. Am I getting a clear picture of it? You are. I mean, I think there are lots of pockets of expertise you need to piece together to break into the independent broker-dealer channel. You, first of all, 
you know, it helps to have a track record manage, managing institutional money in that exact same space successfully. And uh, at that point, you want to diversify your funding sources and you start to explore uh, the retail channel. Uh, you have to decide what your strategy is. Are you going to be, you know, building a, a, a sales team uh, or are you going to be renting one? Are you going to be building the back office IT and, and, and staff or are you going to be renting? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, there are a lot of things that can add to the value of a franchise long run. I think spending on uh, back office IT and uh, uh, getting up that learning curve with the professionals who you hire to run the back office is probably not one of those things that is going to uh, add to, to the value of the franchise long term uh, because you're building something that's already been built. And, and uh, with the financial advisors involved in the space who log on to a web portal, uh, you know, or, or, or call a uh, call center, they, they like continuity. And um, if uh, Great Lakes Fund Solutions has been uh, the service provider to uh, a, a hotel uh, uh, portfolio and, uh, and uh, development team and then, uh, and, and sold through uh, advisor XYZ, uh, when XYZ goes to do a multifamily uh, deal and finds that, hey, I'm working with the same team, the same uh, website to get what I need. Uh, on the back office side, they're like, okay, great. Let's focus on what really matters is, you know, how you guys are going to manage this money and provide a return. Yeah. And uh, do you provide any kind of, um, I guess, consulting work to help these firms uh, maximize their sales team's effectiveness, or do you simply handle the back office administration end of it? In, you know, I mean, if someone is brand new to the uh, retail channel, uh, there are there is advice I can give to, uh, you know, make sure they know what they're getting into, make sure they know that it you know, it's going to be different than um, some similar things that they may have done in the past. Uh, I can introduce them to consultants who will take it to the next level to uh, do financial projections and uh, uh, have a formal process of, hey, let's do a, no, a go, no go analysis before we just jump into this. And let's budget how much it you know, it's likely to take to get you to the point where you've, you've accomplished some of the objectives you've laid out in terms of how much you're going to raise. And uh, it, you know, you've, you've seen it during your time in the space. People come, people go. Um, it, you know, it's either through, uh, you know, those who go might be they didn't spend enough time, you know, running projections and, or realizing how hard it was going to be. Um, uh, the people who were successful were methodological about it and and persistent and um, listened and provided products that met the needs that uh, that the advisors were saying uh, were required. Yeah. Now your firm, Great Lakes Fund Solutions, uh, I would call you a robust boutique firm, and you you bring some some advantages both in your size, coupled with your extensive experience. Can you talk about, you know, your agility as a firm and maybe some, I don't know if it's customizations or why would a, why would a broker dealer that has a product to distribute, why would they, you know, consider what you're offering as opposed to, you know, the traditional or, or maybe something that's a little bit more um, corporate or boring or I don't mean just uh -huh. disparaging, but you, I think you get the point. What, what makes Great Lakes kind of uh, stand out? Well, I think that's a fair characterization, but you know, increasingly uh, uh, the challenge that we find is, you know, how to maintain the um, that high touch and uh, and scale at the same time, and um, uh, how to organize yourself and train staff and um, uh, uh, invest in IT to uh, to be able to pull that off 
uh, effectively. And, you know, the, uh, you know, yes, we're, we're, uh, we're on a first name basis with the advisors and the, uh, many of the investors, uh, that, uh, that call into the company or, or, or email us. And, um, uh, and that's, that's helpful. And, and part of that you're able to do because you know, although the uh, independent broker de dealer channel may seem massive, it's really not that big compared to the hedge fund world or or or, or some other uh, industries. So, um, in in many uh, in many ways, maintaining that uh, high touch uh, boutique uh, feel is really the job at hand. Now, do you like that personally? I mean, was that was that a, attracted? what attracted you to do this? Um, because you've, you've been with some, you know, obviously much larger shops. You've been in a couple of the meccas of the financial services business in the world. Uh, were you drawn, you know, to come back home and to provide this more of a, you know, call it Midwestern feel and, or, or, or are you just looking to, you know, to kind of take this Midwestern company and really branch it out? I mean, you've been running it for seven years now, seven years and seven months, seven days and seven hours, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, congrats on that, by the way. But are you, are you looking to maintain that Midwest culture or is this just the beginning? I think it's just the beginning. The, um, you know, banks, uh, what they, a bank similar to the ones that I've worked with in the past, uh, they have broadly diversified clients that are in each and every piece of the asset management business. And from time to time, they'll submit a request for a proposal to say, we are going to shop for the whole thing. We, we, we're at too many places. It, it's evolved over time. We've got 17 service providers. It's a mess. We're going to consolidate with the best of class. And when uh, one of the big uh, securities processing banks gets an RFP like that, they want to be able to say with confidence, we can service each and every one of those 17 variations on a theme uh, in investment management properly. And uh, even a little niche like the independent broker dealer channel with real estate and uh, energy and manage futures uh you know that's good that that could be number 17 and so the 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 bank is looking to uh be able to say hey we we can calculate commission and uh send commission reports at at both the uh, home office level and the advisor level we can uh uh provide a web portal at those various levels too the home office level, the advisor level, the investor level. And, uh, you know, we can do sales literature fulfillment. We can uh, uh, have a, uh, an easy to use due diligence data room. Uh, and uh, these little pieces of things that present the whole package of services to a particular industry become important because they want to win all 17, you know, lines of business. You know, as a as a wholesaler, I can see that being actually an advantage to use my product over maybe a competitor's product is the fact that my company's product is has the the robust boutique firm like yours servicing, has the web portal, has the fulfillment. We know each other on a first name basis. That's a, that can be very attractive as opposed to just being a you know a, a small cog in a in a much larger you know um, company's portfolio, if you want to call it that. So, you know, have, have you seen any kind of um, nuances that the independent financial advisor world demands, you, you know, as, as opposed to the, um, you know, the skill sets that you need to be successful in, in, in this humongous infrastructure of like a hedge fund world? Is there a difference in, in the, call it the nuances or the skills that are necessary for the independent world? Or is it just this? Is it the same? Are these skills just uh, transferable no matter what the size is? Uh, it's been a while since I've been in the hedge fund space, uh, but uh, there's some pretty demanding people there, and uh, and and uh, this space, uh, you know, accuracy and um, 
uh, timeliness is um, absolutely demanded. And, you know, these are busy people, forceful personalities, and, you know, uh, you know, just because we're out in the country, uh, ex-urban Chicago, you know, doesn't mean to, you know, we got, you know, grass in, in, in between our lips as we're <laughs> answering the phone. We're, we're dealing with people that, you know, are, are very demanding. So I see more, more similarities than differences. Well, that's interesting. In, you know, in Chicago, um, you know, especially inside the loop is, is as, aggressive as any other place I've seen on the world, um, as you, as you well know, yet the Midwest does have this kind of a, a you know, just a more, uh, I guess courteous is probably the right word feel to it to where, yes, everyone has the same amount of time and while they don't want to make mistakes and all this, they're, they're more, I guess they're more uh, conscious of the other person being a person as opposed to just a robot, you know, um, or a, a, a bit, Speaking of that, though, I want to ask you about a, a platform. I'm not even sure if you're uh, if you're still active in it or what happened with it. But you know, crowdfunding came about as a popular thing several years ago. And um, in my in my research, you know, I found um, CrowdKey, which is this here. Is, is CrowdKey something that you're still offering, or is that a part of your business that I, that I just haven't really been um, like? It's not on top of my radar, so I haven't seen it. It, it, it hasn't been on the top of my radar for a while. The, the, uh, the decision to, to get into the crowdfunding space uh, was driven by the Jobs Act coming along and um, in me seeing that uh, if you go direct to the investor, you're, uh, you're going to need to automate the trade processing. And... Um, and that trade order automation was eventually going to come to the in independent broker dealer channel anyway. And while the, there was this froth around the crowdfunding space, everybody, you know, uh, looking to get their deal up and, and running. Um, my thought process was, Hey, it, you know, if someone wants to uh, engage us to build something, uh, an IT platform, uh, uh, for them in the crowdfunding space, let's do it because uh, either that's going to be successful and it'll be uh, its own business line uh, or it won't be successful and we're still going to, within the next few years, be able to offer, you know, within the independent broker dealer channel, a much more automated way of processing a ticket other than handwriting a uh, seven page subscription document, making sure everything is perfect, dropping it in the UPS envelope along with the check, sending it off to Lake Villa, Illinois, where, where Lake Villa people can um, uh, type it into the system. Uh, there's still some work to be done and some decisions to be made and, and some leadership to be provided by the industry associations and the broker dealer community to say, you know, We've looked into it. We've decided to automate it. This is how we're going to do it. We've collaborated with our uh, our competitors in this space so that it isn't a, a disaster or a mess uh, or 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 uh, sixteen different protocols to 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 uh, to work with. Um, uh, but progress is being made on that front, and uh, in our experience in um, uh, uh, launching CrowdKey is has been helpful to us and will continue to be helpful to us. Well, you know, I didn't I didn't go to the Kelly School of Business. Um, so when I when I pulled up this schematic, <laughs> I haven't slept in three days, Mark, trying to figure out how this thing works, buddy. You got to show <laughs> me this, what this means. Very very intricate design, um, and I and I bring that up on purpose. Um, you know, the whole concept of crowdfunding, to me, uh, it, it, was, it was kind of like, uh, like Bill Backrack. I don't know if you know Bill Backrack. He's an industry uh, coaching guru for financial advisors. Anyways, he, he, he talks about the drum machine, right? And the drum machine back in the 80s was going to ruin music. And the drum machine never misses a beat, right? It's perfect. It's, you don't have to worry about a drummer. 
but then could you imagine taking the drummer out of like Led Zeppelin? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's, it's just, it takes the soul out of it. So crowdfunding to me kind of takes the, it allows the investor to go right to the manufacturer, right to the company that you can do. And it takes kind of the soul of the, call it the sales process out of it. In the independent space, probably even in hedge funds, these are things that are not necessarily bought. They're things that are sold. They're very sophisticated. They require an extreme amount of faith and trust and goodwill because to understand them completely is almost it's almost, you know, undone, it's almost unreasonable for an investor to be able to do that, even an accredited investor. So to take away the, call it the sales relationship for the financial advisor and the wholesaler with the investor, you know, to pull that out in the effort to create this scalable crowdfunding vehicle, to me, didn't seem like it would be viable. It's kind of like art, artificial intelligence. You know, there's nobody that's being able to create an emotional artificial intelligence so i wonder what your opinion is on that and do you think that that can crowdfunding kind of cover the gap that's going to be left if you take out the the sales process for these investments well i think you're exactly right they're bought not sold but what does the sales process mean it means that uh, the broker dealer whose neck is on the line has to be very confident that this multifamily fund is better than the other ones that are out there. And that their due diligence person knows enough to uh, be able to do a competent analysis or, uh, or, or get feedback from uh, independent parties that are doing competent analyses. And uh, so that the salespeople can be educated and then confidently go out and say, you know, this is the process we went through. This is why I can look you in the eye and, and, and say that, that, you know, I believe in this product. Um, and, uh, and you're, you know, you, you, you can't sleep. You're sitting on your pajamas. You log in, you, you, you log into the crowdfunding site and, and see an equivalent or, or, or what purports to be a, an equivalent process, how is it that you, you know, you suddenly you're an expert in multifamily real estate? I think probably not. Um, you, you need uh, some, some advice, some um, screening, some uh, benchmarking that is just unlikely to materialize in the direct to investor market in its current form. Would it be possible for service providers uh, to uh, play a role that did some of that? Uh, you know, potentially. Uh, we're not there yet, so. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, and I, I like the way that your, you know, your firm's gonna support these product manufacturers, um, for lack of better words. And I, I do think though that it's gonna be difficult for any kind of uh, replacement of the human element you know the robots are coming right <laughs> but i don't believe they're going to be able to, to to replace that and we all know that people make decisions emotionally and then then back them with logic so i i encourage you know you and your firm to continue to explore that and then continue to polish this crowdfunding platform and I, I also believe that it might not replace the direct sales platform but it could very well augment it it could very well be a source of additional um, confidence built to kind of to spawn that relationship with that firm. So it's interesting to see how it comes and goes. Now, these different ideas come and go. For instance, um, back when back when you were dealing with hedge funds and managed futures, they were so small of a piece of the pie compared to mutual funds. Um, and, and they've grown quite a bit. Now we've seen non-traded REITs, which were the, the darling of the independent broker-dealer alternative space. They have, they have you know, evolved and grown and they've, they've expanded and dramatically contracted and now they're on an expansion run again. But then there's also been all these other pr programs layered in, like a BDC, business development companies, like um, interval funds. And now we're seeing the latest, um, 
you know, I don't want to call it uh, the hot thing is opportunity zones. And, you know, you mentioned in some of your writings that there's a little bit of a difficulty in, you know, coming up with a, a way to, to quantify those and to put a dollar amount on them. Can you talk about a little bit this new thing called opportunity zones and maybe some challenges that you're seeing as they develop? And if you think it's going to be a flash in the pan or are they here to stay? Well, I mean, it's up to Congress whether they're here to stay ultimately, but um, there's a window of opportunity for those who move quickly. Um, the, there is plenty of reason for caution because uh, just like the uh, Jobs Act led to the crowdfunding industry, which has certainly had a flash in the pan quality to it, um, I think there are people come out of the woodwork and uh, see a change in tax law and fancy themselves to be real estate experts or, 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 or whatever. And um, that, you know, caution is uh, advisable. However, there are other experienced uh, real estate professionals and um, or uh, property development specialist, uh, specialists that um, uh, are, are, are moving uh, quickly to take advantage of uh, uh, this opportunity to um, put together a, uh, a sales force that can find people who uh, have the right set of circumstances uh, to benefit from it. And, um, you know, it's going to be a tale of two cities things where, where there are spectacular flop stories and, and, and spectacular success stories, I think. You are a cultured man. The tale of two cities. I love it. <laughs> Never read it. <laughs> Never read it. <laughs> That's funny. I don't know if you can if you can speak to it like you did. But, I mean, you know, we would never know unless you told them. But um, th that is an interesting, you know, way to, to look at it. Um, let's let's talk a little more tactical. Like you've been in the business now at Great Lakes. I've seen you at a decent. I've seen you at the conferences for, and has it been seven years now? No, close to it. And you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of product distribution. Can you give some of the teams, some of the wholesalers that are on the line, tuning in, watching us on YouTube or iTunes, whatever they get their awesome wholesaler experience podcast, can you give them some tips on what you've seen that, they, that, that you've seen that's really worked well and that maybe they, they, that they should stop doing? Um, you know, anything in between there? In, in terms of the the approaches that the wholesalers take to to uh, to get a new product sold, um, gosh, well, I mean, you know, I think it is, uh, yeah. First of all, hire you know if you're a sponsor entering the space, hire a professional because you know your fraternity buddy <laughs> is unlikely to cut it um, because they've got a new industry to learn, a whole new series of people uh, to 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 meet. Uh, they haven't seen people come and go. They don't know what uh, is, uh, they don't know the service providers that are required. Um, uh, so, that, I mean, you've got a real advantage, to, whether it's hiring a consultant, uh, hiring a managing broker dealer, hiring a, a transfer agent. You've got an opportunity to to have a plug and play approach uh, uh, happen, and still overlay your own uh, philosophy and business strategy, uh, and, and change that as you go forward as suits your needs. And uh, you know why not embrace that, uh, and then um, uh, you know carefully plan out how you modify that strategy going forward to build your franchise. So if I'm a wholesaler, if I'm a wholesaler and I'm out there and I'm young and eager and, uh, you know, all of my socks have been colorful, I've never worn a pair of just plain dark socks, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, what do I do? How do I break through and, and get some traction with this new, call it creative fund that uh, I find myself representing? What What are some of the you know, if you have any, what are some of the things that you've seen some wholesale teams do well? well ah, gosh, I mean, I've seen a, a, a lot of uh, 
real solid performers. I mean, uh, I, some articulate and smart people uh, getting involved with the conference planning and um, uh, putting up some um, engaging and entertaining um, uh, presentations or panels. And uh, I've seen uh, people do uh, a, a booth that's particularly compelling, uh, uh, a uh, the client entertainment that's particularly, uh, you know, just well thought out. Um, uh, Great Lakes, we get compliments all the time for the things we give away at the booth. It's like, where did you come up with that? Um, and so, you know, putting time and thought into the approach you take, the image you're, you're projecting, uh, pays off. People notice, especially when there's so many products out there that, uh, um, might siphon off some of your attention if uh, if they do it better. Yes. Yeah, so, so the tchotchke business, is that what you see for the future for Great Lakes Fund Solutions? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, what do you see? I mean, you're seven and a half years in. Uh, things are, are arguably going well. You never know when the, uh, the you know, the the next foot's going to drop or the shoe's going to drop. Um, um, so what, what do you see is for the next five, 10 years of, uh, of Great Lakes Fund solutions? Uh, you know, I mean, what, you know, we've accomplished a huge, huge list of things over the, the past eight years. We've um, built to my alma mater, DTCC AIP. We've, uh, we were never processing distributions before because managed futures generally don't do distributions. We, we, we uh, you know, had been printing checks and things, but never really been the conduit through which bank accounts were, 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 were opened. We, uh, we, we did a, a new uh, user interface. We, we, we add a, added accounting services that we hadn't done uh, previously. Uh, so we made a lot of progress uh, dur during that seven year period. The next seven years is going to be about, um, uh, you know, modernizing our database, which we're uh, just in the final uh, stages of doing and having more of an API um, uh, application protocol interface uh, capability. We uh, uh, scaling, how do you scale uh, uh, effectively and reorganize to accommodate that scalability? Easier said than done. It involves uh, embracing uh, training in uh, and, and process uh, and documentation of process in a, in a way that is a step up from, from what we'd been doing before. And it, uh, it, it sounds easier than it is. <laughs> yeah, so do you consider the, the next five to 10 years still just more uh, service and dominance in the independent broker dealer alternative investment space? Is that your, is that your, uh, you're the big fish in that small pond mentality? Well, the, um, you know, we're the small fish in, in a relatively small pond. Um, uh, and uh, we're going to work real hard to be the solid, uh, high touch, medium sized fish in that, in that small pond. Um, that, uh, you know, I think the, the fundamentals are good for the space. I think people, uh, uh, want alternative investment products, and uh, and the market is um, is adaptable enough to uh, find a way to give people what they're looking for. Well, I appreciate you doing that, and there's a lot of my brothers and sisters in that marketplace. So I hope that uh, everyone's successful. You know, as we round as we round third base and head for home on the show today, uh, I have a couple of signature questions. And I ask all of the guests these, and it's interesting to see the array of uh, creative and uh, interesting answers. Um, so without further ado, Mark, if you, by, by the way, what is the deal with the honking of the horns in Chicago? Total sidebar. They're, they, they're, they're honkers in Chicago. I was, you know, I was going around the city thinking you're like what the heck where, where when did chicago runs become honkers um it, it yeah it, it it's 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 for sure the case it was just the last weekend that i was noticing 
Yeah, I've covered Chicago for years. And at first I was very, I was upset about it. Because, you know, from Detroit, you honk your horn. Those are almost fighting words. You know, it's like, I don't know what the deal is. But uh, Chicago, it's like a wave. You know, beep, 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 beep. It's, 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 it's like the cars are talking to themselves or something. Uh, an interesting thing. Um, everybody's on everybody's on their own time. And um, I, I, is New York like that, too? I haven't spent as much time in New York. Is any yeah. Car- yeah, any crowded yeah. city where there's traffic everywhere. Just yeah, like, there used to be a sign just across the street here in uh, in Brooklyn that said, you know, honk in danger. And someone crossed out the D, honk in anger. <laughs> wow. You know, That's particularly good. on a street like mine that where the traffic doesn't move particularly well during rush hour. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I just I heard a couple of honks while we were you know, doing the show here, and I'm like, wow, he that's amazing the honking. Okay, so you 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 pick up the phone, and on the other end of the phone, answers a 25 year old Mark Lancaster, and you've got five minutes with his full attention. What advice would you give to your younger self? Gosh. Uh you know, uh, at this point, from a career perspective, I, I'm, I'm think I'm telling myself just to, uh, you know, to, to, to meddle out, take it, you know, uh, don't get so worked up about it. Uh, I remember a colleague asked, you know, this is a few late, uh, years later after my, uh, uh into my career but at, you know was teasing me about how old my phone was how big and clunky and old my phone was and and i told him well you know i i like to think of myself in a foxhole sort of calling in the <laughs> calling in the strike and uh it, which at times you know working for a big organization relationship management yeah, yeah and and you know you're you're, you're hearing about problems and trying to get them solved as quickly as possible so that the organization can you know uh, improve the, uh, the, 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 the service quality. But yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd get super wound up about these issues and, and, uh, you know, you know, come out swinging, whether it's in how I write the call report or who I'm, you know, on the phone with to, to try to get the, uh, the issue resolved. But I think that it, it, it might be to say, all right, you know, Job one is to protect the relationships you've developed here at, at, at the institution because you're really not going to get uh, uh, get too much accomplished if you burn those bridges um, and uh, and things are going to go wrong. They just have a tendency to do it because clients change, you know, their business and and. You know, if you're providing a service, sometimes they don't even tell you they've changed until, you know, the service provider notices, wait a minute, this is totally different. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, you, you just got to, um, uh, you know, keep your cool and uh, 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 maintain the relationships to get it done. Um, and, uh, yeah, was... It just that it's gonna it's it's gonna work out that 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 uh, uh, on the personal level too you know you're missing a wedding because you're you know uh, you're you're out of work and looking for a job well it's probably gonna be okay maybe you ought to go to that wedding you know is it really gonna you know some something gonna land you in your lap that weekend you know probably not and and play it forward a few years you're gonna meet, miss the you know, thousand bucks that it took you to fly overseas to, 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 to get to that wedding. Uh, yeah, probably not. So, um, that would be a little bit of my advice. Wow. Great answer. Great answer. And, uh, second question, Mark, if you could have any superpower, any one of, did you like, which one would you choose and what would you do with it? God, you know, I, you know, just, uh, I, you know, I, I, I love, uh, economics. I studied economics, uh, undergrad. I, I read the economist. I love it. I, I, you know, I would love to be just, uh, to be able to have an influence on social policy in a, in a way that, that could help 
people um, uh, because you, I've just seen, you know, particularly recently when, uh, uh, you know, we, we get on the wrong path. We don't understand really how, uh, how people work enough to know that, you know, if you set up this incentive structure, then, you know, everyone's going to go the other way. Um, you know, I, you know, I, politics is an ugly business and, and, and I, I've never wanted to be a politician, but, uh, uh, but I guess I'm saying that I wish, uh, I could, uh, have that same sort of influence uh, without the, uh, the baggage of having to be a politician. <laughs> Politics in, in Illinois and particularly Chicago land are very interesting, let's say. Yeah. You know, the, the, the wrong thing can happen year after year after year and, uh, everybody can know it and you still find yourself where you find yourself. Uh, yeah, they've had some colorful characters over the years and, you know, in generations in Chicago. So that, that's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Now, isn't, uh, did I read something that, you're, uh, that, you're, that your son is uh, acting now? He's actually in a play or something like that. Is that still? It's, it, it, in fact, it was, uh, it's, uh, the play is called Yen. It's at the Raven Theater. And, uh, uh, they've just got a, uh, you know, the Tony Awards in New York. They're the Jeff Awards in Chicago. And, um, the, uh, the, it just got announced, uh, uh, the nominees for the year and the play's been nominated for, uh, best, uh, best production, uh, for the year. And two of the actors in the show have been, uh, nominated as, uh, you know, best, best supporting, uh, actors. Wow. Well, tell Reed that we say uh, break a leg and I uh, hope that that works out terrifically. Hey, Mark, I want to just quickly wrap up and say thanks for your friendship. Thanks for the service that you're providing to, you know, our industry as a wholesaler for the past two decades. I've seen all kinds of support and all kinds of people with different agendas and different mentalities. And for some reason, um, you know, I, I don't know if we're both Midwest guys, but I really appreciate you know, what you do and, and how you bring your flavor of life to it. I've enjoyed a lot of our conversations, um, sometimes at some of our competitors' booths, <laughs> hanging out a little bit there. But I just want to say thanks for, for doing that. And, um, you know, how can folks reach out to you? Uh, I mentioned Great Lakes Fund Solutions, but is there a particular way to reach out to you other than just the website? Uh, my email address, Mark L at G L F si.com yeah um and yeah so go ahead good good sorry and um he he is on the the interwebs but he's he's not a uh instagram model so he's not all over the place but linkedin for sure as uh, you can find mark on linkedin he is connected to me uh and of course if you have any uh, inquiries or if you'd like a request for proposal uh, to see if if great lakes can provide some uh, solutions for your firm um, definitely connect with me or go straight to, to Great Lakes Fund Solutions and I'm sure they can, uh, can help you out. So, so again, Mark, thanks for, for you know, being yourself and for doing that. Thanks for being on the show today. And uh, I'm sure that all of your clients appreciate you and, and we all wish you much fortune and success both now and in the future. And as we say on the Awesome Wholesaler Experience Podcast, it's about the journey. And Mark, we wish you well on yours. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Wholesalers, financial advisors, thanks for listening. And if you'd like to support the show, go ahead and click that subscribe button and that little bell next to it will make sure that you get notified uh, every time that we drop a new episode. And um, while they're not, uh, they're not demanded or they're not, uh, what do you call it, uh, assumed, I do appreciate all the ratings and reviews that I do get. So appreciate that. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. Thanks for supporting the show. And, of course, thanks for being awesome. Good night, everybody.